Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. All right. Good morning, Crossroads. My name is Marcus. For those of you who are online, we just want to say welcome to Crossroads Church this morning. Uh, if you have your app, it should be, your notes should be in the app. If not, that's perfectly fine because we'll have some scriptures here on the board. But we are in a series entitled Run. Can you say run with me? Run. <clears throat> Run with, not, not run with me, but yeah, run. <laughs> and so the scripture, we're talking about this idea called run. Every year we have a word, and the, the word for Crossroads Church this year is run. You know, for the last couple of years, it felt like, man, we were ready to run, but then we got stopped. This COVID and all this stuff that's going on. So we've paused, we've ramped back up, we've paused again, ramped back up. It felt like this last December, the whole city got covid and it was just a crazy deal. So, but this is where we're going to run regardless of what's taking place. Amen. So there's, a, there's a passion, there's a call, there's a, a commitment that we are making within ourselves to continue to preach this gospel. Because if anything, it slowed down some of the stuff that we, were, uh, we had intentions to do. And so this year we're going um, forward in, in his name, amen. Enough of just kind of strolling along and hiding behind masks and playing defense and you know, grabbing stimulus checks and just chilling out in the, in the, in the what you want to call it, in the bedroom. I mean, not in the bedroom, but in the couch <laughs> or whatever. said, we're, we're going to move forward. The scripture tells us in 1 Corinthians, it says, run in such a way that you win. I don't know about you, but have you ever been in a, a sprint or a marathon? Uh, either way, regardless of the race, you don't run just to, just to participate. You run with a, with a focus, with an intention to get a prize, right? You run to win. And I remember they put me in a mile run, and I was a sprinter. And I was like, oh, I can do it, because I was just filling in a spot. And uh, so I started the mile, and I was doing good, keeping up pace for the first lap. You know, it was four laps. After the third lap, I was dead last. But I knew I had to run. I knew I had to finish, because the guy that was, I was competing with, there was like two guys way in the back. And the guy that I was competing with was from Meister. And I was from Sager, and I was like, I can't let this guy win. And so it seemed like we were the ones in first place because everyone already had finished, and we're just going out, trying to beat each other at the very last so we won't get last. And all the crowd was like, yeah, go, Avalos, go, Avalos. And I sucked it up, and I won second to the last place, and it was awesome. But you run in such a way that you want to win, right? You know, the Scripture talks about our Heavenly Father and how He is always running. It says that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro. That shouldn't scare you, but the eyes of the Lord, he knows exactly what you're doing, where you're at in life, how your heart is humble, and what you want to get rid of in your life, and all those things. He says he's running to and fro, and he wants to show himself strong to those whose hearts are loyal to him. To, not perfect towards him, but they want to serve him. They want to please the Father. As a matter of fact, when you take a look at Luke's gospel, you'll see the story or the parable of a prodigal son, uh, uh, someone who had you know, favor with his dad, but he asked, he had some fleshly desires and he didn't delay gratification. So he went out there and spent everything that he had, wound up in a pig's pen. And then he wound, when his, when he, when he came to himself, it says that he went back to his dad. Because man, what am I thinking? My dad's always been there for me. And when he was going back, the scripture says that the father was running toward, he was going towards him. Why? Because he wants to restore. He wants to encourage. He wants to build up. He wants to strengthen you. He wants to put you back in a good place in life, right? So regardless of what your past is, regardless of your hiccups, your hangups, your habits, your addictions, whatever that is, regardless of your marriage, whether it's good, bad, or ugly, God wants to restore you. He wants to get you on the right path. He wants to encourage you. He wants to build you up. God is not mad at you in 2022. He is pleased. He wants to encourage and help you and restore you back to himself. Amen? Amen. And so the scripture tells us that we are not only to understand that your father is running, but we are encouraged also to imitate our father and to run like he runs. As a matter of fact, David said it this way. He says, man, I run to his commandments. I run along the path towards his word. Why? Because it was him that set my heart free. Isaiah says, those who wait on the Lord, they will renew their strengths. They will run and not grow weary, walk and not faint. Samuel, when you take a look at the, the book of Samuel or the man Samuel, he would say this to you. He goes, hey, listen, by him, you can run. Regardless of what's in your way, whatever troops in your way, whatever obstacles in your way, he says, you can run through that troop and by your God, you can leap over a wall. When you look, look at a Solomon, it says in Proverbs, it says that the name of the Lord is a strong tower. 
And the righteous do what? They run to it. Because in that place, it's safe. Amen. There's another passage in Habakkuk. It says, if you have a vision, if you have a dream, if God's given you something that um, he's put in your heart to fulfill, sometimes the things that he gives us are a little scary sometimes. It's like, man, I can't do that. I can't be a part of that. I don't have anything to say. But he says, you write that vision down. You write that dream down. You write that thing. God puts those desires in your heart. It's not about you being selfish and you being the, you know, the big guy on the totem pole. It's not about just every, all the attention being drawn to you. God wants to use you to get things done that he needs to get done Amen. here in this community and surrounding area. Amen. So he said, write that vision down because sometimes it's going to be difficult whenever you're trying to navigate and you're trying to get to this dream. It's like stuff's going to happen. And if you allow it, you'll start letting the dream die and you just set it on the side and you'll abort the dream that God has in your heart. And he says, if you write that vision down and you begin to read it, you start struggling through stuff, just start reading it. Because once you start reading, vision will come back up and then you'll run, you'll run when you read it. And all of a sudden you'll get inspired on the inside. So there's a, a lot of exhortations that take place regarding running. So we're taking a look at that. And Pastor Joel started uh, a couple of weeks ago in this series. And he mentioned a couple of things uh, regarding this idea of running. The first thing he mentioned is that whenever you run, there's always suffering involved, right? Anybody a runner here? One person, good. And, and, and whenever you get involved in that, there's, man, there's a commitment, but there's pain involved too. Suffering can take place. There's nothing wrong with suffering. There's uh, suffering that's for the good of the overall picture, and then there's self-inflicted suffering. So he talked about that. I encourage you to go get that message. And a lot of times we need to stay away from the stuff that we inflict ourselves with. And let's do the suffering that really counts. Amen. And then he starts talking about last week that nobody really liked that message because he talked about discipline. I'm not saying it was a fantastic message. But in this idea of running, there is discipline that needs to take place. And the foundation of discipline is something called delayed gratification. Delayed gratification. And so delayed gratification is there are stuff that you and I are going to contend with. There is stuff that's going to entice us. There's going to be stuff that's going to try to pull you away from the original race. And if we don't learn how to slay, slay, say no to this flesh, we'll just buy into that, that pull immediately. It's like, you know, it's just like giving a kid a, a chocolate bar and say, don't eat that. Leave that there. It's like, whatever, here. They, immediately they want to gratify their fleshly desires. And a lot of times, there are things that are not necessarily wrong, but the Lord's telling us, hey, put that away right now. You don't need that. But all of a sudden, you know, our, our flesh pulls. You know, you will have an effect. Your life will have an effect if you constantly go by that orange and white sign uh, building there on 46 called Waterburger and <laughs> keep ordering that number one burger with cheese and double fries and a large drink. Um, you, might, you might love it in that moment, but if you don't learn how to delay the gratification in that moment, you're going to become like, you know, Santa Claus or whatever, and it's not going to be well with you, right? And so he talks about delayed gratification, and today uh, I'm going to bring another angle of running because we want you to look. You have to understand our heart. Our heart is for you to win. Our heart is for you to succeed. Our heart is for you to run your race in such a way that you accomplish the vision, accomplish the dream that God has given you. But you also have to understand that this race that you and I are running, it, it, it's not like, it's not at the speed of light. Yeah. It's, that, it's at the speed of a seed. The speed of a light comes with, you know, you want the microwave stuff, it's quick. But the speed of a seed, you plant, you water, it nurtures, the sun comes. Sometimes it starts withering away. You've got to take care of it. You've got to prune it back up. You've got to get rid of the weeds. You've got to stop smoking weed. You've got to do all this stuff. And then all of a sudden, it just it prolongs. The next thing you know, you find yourself, oh, this is the rhythm. This is the season. This is the cycle that I am. And then you succeed, man. And then you're able to have wisdom that you can impart to others. And so this morning, what I want to do is give you this idea. Another, another aspect of running is to run. Don't ever run alone. You have to have a mentor beside you. Run in such a way, you know, run with passion, 
run with strength, run with honor, run moving forward, but don't ever, ever think that you can run alone. You and I need this idea called mentors. What is a mentor? A mentor is someone, it's like a life coach. It's like a coach who helps you and instructs you. A mentor is a person that can prevent you from getting stuck. Why? Because he's gone there before. He understands, like, man, you don't see what I see, but if you keep going that path, you're going to fall in this ditch. Anybody have mentors or individuals that, how many of you guys have had people speak into your life that you listened to and it was better for you? How many of you guys have had the same people speak into your life and you didn't listen to and that was the dumbest thing you've ever done, <laughs> right? There's regrets because of that. And so we're talking about uh, having individuals in our lives that help us and encourage us and help us understand that, hey, there's things that we need to stay away from. There's things that we need to really just pursue and get a hold of in our life. So years ago, you know, when I came to Christ, I was 19 years old, and um, <clears throat> I, I loved sports and I always had coaches and people speak into my life. My greatest hero and my greatest mentor is my father, my dad. He taught me something early on. You know, I, didn't tell him, I didn't say this in the first service because he was in here. <laughs> Not that it mattered, but I just forgot about it. But my, my dad taught me one, one lesson. He taught me a lot of lessons. I remember one lesson he taught me because he was a um, backyard mechanic. And so I've shared this with you before, but the lawnmower was messed up. And I was determined because I was, you know, all but 14 years old. Like, Dad, I know how to fix that. It's, it's that spark plug. I said, son, it's not the spark plug. I said, dad, it is a spark plug. I can see it. It's a spark plug. He goes, okay, well, then put your finger up. to touch it then. <laughs> and so I didn't. I just, it just shocked the heck out of me. He goes, he starts laughing. He goes, I told you it wasn't a spark plug. <laughs> I was like, okay. But the greatest lesson he ever taught me was this. He goes, Marcus, mind your own business. <laughs> My, and that little advice right there has helped me more than any, pastor, did you hear about so-and-so? It's like, bro, mind your own business. Ain't none of my business. You want that to be your business? Let it be your business. It's not my business. As soon as you yield to that and let it become a part of your business, then you're going to have regrets later on, right? It's just like the, you know, the ladies or the guys that say, I need that. Look who came into the church. Do you know I just saw her last night with so-and-so? Mind your own business. Anyways, that's not part of the notes, but still, <laughs> um, I was growing up, and I still contended with something inside of my own soul. I call it the inner critic. The inner critic was so loud, but it would say something like this, who do you think you are? You're not good enough. You're not qualified for that. You know, you don't have an education. You know, dad was a blue collar. You're, one, you're Hispanic, and they don't, they don't climb up the ladder and succeed. They don't lead things. They're just servants. That inner critic just constantly harassed me. And anytime I felt like I had a dream to move forward, I would hear that inner critic. It's like, you know what? I, I can't do that. I, I'm not, I, you know, I, can't, I don't qualify for that stuff. And then all of a sudden, I came to Christ, and I realized that, man, I had been forgiven Man, it was, God had loved me. He spared my life. He was so merciful and kind to me. And, but I still, had, I still struggled with that mentality. And I finally was confronted with that inner critic, but it didn't take myself to discover that and to understand what was going on there. It took a mentor because he would see and he would hear my words and he would see my actions and he knew exactly what was going on. So he would address it. One of the greatest mentors, if not the greatest other than my father, that came into my life was a, a pastor friend who was a mentor to me, like a dad to me. His name was Don Duncan. And so I went under his ministry in New Braunfels, and he pulled me aside one day, and he said this, Marcus, don't you ever let your past dictate your future. Don't ever let your past dictate your, your future. You're qualified. Not in your own goodness, not in your own works, but you're qualified because of what Jesus did. Amen. When God sees you, he doesn't see you based upon all your past. He sees you because of the potential he put inside of you by his spirit because of his son. Amen. 
And all of a sudden, my mind began to shift. And I began to grow stronger. I began to be qualified in my head and in my heart and in my disposition. Began to minister the gospel with strength. And, and I would honor God, and I still honor God, because of, of that place that was rooted and established in my soul. That I was constantly contending with. I still contend with that same inner critic even now. But now I know how to fight against it. There's tools that I have now that fight against it. And then when I was in my strength as a young boy, as a young man, I um, was in a, um, a meeting one day, a big conference one day, and, and he was the speaker, my pastor was the speaker. And I remember him waving by at, uh, after the offering. He goes down to the associate pastor and he says, I'm having a heart attack. Take me to the hospital. And that was the day, I, the last day I've ever saw him alive. He died. And man, a, a hole was in my heart. I went to the hospital afterwards, and I was the only one left after everyone was gone, just him and I, and he laid there on that white sheet over him with blood seeping through those sheets, wondering why I just found someone that I could, I could trust. So I kept going. I felt a little cloud of depression come on, but I kept ministering the gospel. And then all of a sudden, that inner critic kept creeping back in. And I began to listen to it more. I didn't have someone who was seeing me and respond how I was responding. So I didn't have a coach like I had. Uh, the one I was looking for was no longer there. So I began to buy into the lie, and I wound up just, my growth started weaning down a little bit. And I was frustrated, and I didn't know what was going on. And all that time, I would get to this place, and I would begin to question myself. I wish I would have listened to my pastor more. Then I wouldn't have to feel this way. Do you ever hear that before? Do you ever hear that voice? Man, I wish I, I should have listened to so-and-so. Then I wouldn't be in the situation that I'm in today. Well, if, if you haven't done that, I, I did that. Now, if you're honest with you, you know you went through the same thing, too. You have regrets in life. How many guys have had people in your life that told you not to do something or stay away from something or do something, and you wish right now you would have listened to them? I wish, you wish you would have listened to your mom and dad when they told you, don't you dare play house with that guy before you get married. Now you wind up with the heartache like that. Don't, don't, my dad would say, goes, Marcus, don't you dare start, don't start racing that 67 GTO. Man, I wish I'd have listened to him because then I would have still had it. Now it's all in pieces, wrecked. I wish I would have listened to my pastor when he says, your friends will influence the direction and course of your life. Then if I would have listened to him, man, I would have been in a whole lot better situation in my life. Anybody ever, ever uh, have that statement that says, man, I wish I would have listened to that, that red flag that was on the inside of me that the Holy Spirit was saying, don't stay away from that. And we yielded to that. Next thing you know, you know, we got triplets or whatever. I don't know what that what happened, but something happened. And I, all of us have been there before, right, in life. You, you wind up self-sabotaging yourself. You, you climb up, you do well, and then all of a sudden, the inner critic gets louder, and thought patterns and things, you begin to do things that will sabotage the success that God wants you to have yeah. in the beginning. Does that make sense? Yeah. We all struggle with those kind of things. And if you and I want to run effectively in our race that God has given us here on this earth, we can run with passion, we can run with strength, we can run with all might on the inside, but... We cannot run by ourselves. We've got to have mentors in our lives. Who's speaking into your life? You know, when you look at Scripture, Jesus uh, had a mentored 12. He mentored sometimes three. Sometimes he just mentored one. We have individuals like Jethro who mentored Moses. Moses mentored Joshua. Paul mentored Timothy. Barnabas mentored a murderer like Paul. Elizabeth, who was the mother of John the Baptist, mentored the mother of Jesus. On and on we see. But who's mentoring you? Where are you going to? Even as well as like, man, I'm 70 years old. I don't need no mentor. I am a mentor. Are you really? It doesn't matter how old I get. I still, I'm looking for someone 10 years or older 
that has had life experience that I can just go sit down and have a cup of coffee with or whatever and just let him, I'll ask him questions. I'll just suck the life out of him <laughs> because I, I know that that's, that's how I, I grew up. My dad always told me, he goes, son, respect your elders. And I don't care if they're just one year older than you. Respect your elders. I said, yes, sir. And so even though I'm around other individuals that are older than me, I'm trying to glean what's going on. What do they know that I don't know? And I even have seven questions that I ask individuals. One of the questions I ask is, how did you treat failure in your life? Another question I ask is, what book are you reading or have you read that I need to read? There's just different questions. If you want them, just text me and I'll text them to you. But um, what I was saying is this, who's speaking into your life? And every year, some of you guys know this, but I always have, uh, I get one word and I try to wrap my brain and filter my life through that one word. This year, my word is hold fast. And um, then I get one scripture that's, that's connected to that word. And I put God's word because God's word is powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. God's word helps me to discern that which comes from my soul, that which comes from my spirit. And then I get one person. I look for an individual that I respect and honor, and I try to take time in the year to spend time with them just to glean the wisdom that they have in their life. I always encourage folks to get somebody 10 years older and somebody 10 years younger so that you can just speak into their life and mentor and coach them and encourage them. I'm not saying that I go up to them saying, you're my mentor this year. (laughs) I don't go up to Dan and say, Dan, I'm going to mentor you this year. Listen to me. Okay? It's just a lifestyle. Okay? And so it's important, and I encourage you to do that, make that a habit in your life. After my mentor died, I looked for someone to replace him. Man, I looked and I looked. For months, months turned into years. But I never could find someone to replace him. One of the reasons why is because I was looking in the wrong place. The greatest mentor that you find will never come from this thing called earth. You'll never find him among those that walk the earth, for me anyways. The greatest mentor in my life came from another gallery, came from another place. Did you know that God had appointed certain individuals to live their life in such a way that he would be there to encourage, to build up, to strengthen. He would encourage them to run their race in such a way that even though they would die, they would still speak. He, 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 he lived their life and empowered them and encouraged them. And then he allowed someone else after they left this earth to write them down in this manuscript that you and I call the Bible so that when you and I look and read the scriptures, it is not just David's psalm in Psalm 23, it's David mentoring me. It's Abraham mentoring me, teaching me about faith. It's Samson mentoring me, teaching me how to have self-control with sexual promiscuity. It's individuals that I look at in Scripture now that are helping me overcome the day-to-day things that you and I uh, face. Who are your mentors in life? And I just want to encourage you, and I'm not going to say, go find you a mentor. Here's what I want to encourage you to. The bottom line today is when you read your Bible this year, I don't want you to read it with check marks in mind. I don't want you to read it as though it's just a plan in you version, it's like, oh man, I did it. I made it today. Oh, I'm seven days behind. I got to catch up. I'll forget it. I'm never going to catch up. I don't want you to read it that way. I want you to read your Bible this year as if though you have an appointment with a mentor. Does that make sense? I'm telling you, it'll change the way, one, you receive the word, It'll also come alive. It'll come alive in such a way that you'll never be the same again. So this passage that we've been using in the last couple of weeks has come from 
uh, Hebrews, the 12th chapter in verse 1. But there's another passage in Romans, the 15th chapter, that says it's something like this. The reason why those guys, um, those names are written in Scripture is because this. Whatever was written beforehand is meant to instruct us on how you and I can live. The Scriptures imparted us encouragement and inspiration so that we can live in hope. Hope is another word for expecting You ever have individuals that aren't expecting anything but bad to come to their life? Well, the scriptures are here to encourage us so that we can live a life of expectancy that the the, the thing that we will experience are the things that we see in scripture. Expecting God to, to be who God said he was going to be. To live in expectation and endure all things. To endure All those things. Now, in Hebrew, see, Abraham will show you how to live in faith. David had, David will show you how to be a man of courage and fight in strength and fight dangerously, yet keep your heart innocent. Man, there's so many beautiful pictures and so many things that he want, they want to coach us in. If we would just stop and listen and take heed to their counsel, amen. In Hebrews, the 12th chapter, let me just go over this real quick. In Hebrews, it says this. This is a foundation for this series. It says uh, in Hebrews 1, therefore, we also, that's that's you and I. Somebody told me, a mentor told me, uh, whenever you see the word therefore, you have to find out what it's there for. (laughs) And what it's there for has to do with what happens right before that. So this is Hebrews 12, 1. Therefore, you have to look at what happened in Hebrews 11. And what happened in Hebrews 11 is a bunch of heroes of faith, Abraham, Noah, Enoch, Sarah, all these folks, all these folks had run a certain race and they did it in such a way that they won. At the end of that chapter, it says there are individuals who ran hard, but they never got the promise. They were sawn in two. They were, they, they, they died on the side of the road. Does that mean that they were not living a life of faith? No, because when you read about their stories, it inspires me to press in regardless of the outcome. That sometimes we just so happen to be the first man in the leg of the race. And we get that baton, we we, we run with courage, we run with honor. Even though we won't see what's going to happen at the finish line, we know that our part has been played well. And then the next one gets it. Like my daughter. And then my grandson than my granddaughter. And then when I'm up there in heaven, it's like, run, run, keep going, keep going, don't stop. I know it hurts, but endure like a, a hard soldier. Endure, you know, your life in that situation like, like, a, like a, a, a soldier who's fighting in war. Amen. And that's what he's talking about. It's therefore, because of all these things that we've seen and read of all their lives, he says, therefore, let us also... Since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses referring to all those individuals, let us also run like they did. Because there's things that they had to lay aside. There's weight and there's sin that they had to lay aside. There are things that they had to run away from and there's things that they also had to run to so they can have endurance. He says, and the sin which easily ensnares us, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. It's your race. It's no one else's race. Mind your own business. It's your race, right? And so we look at that, and there are so many things that when you look at chapter 11, I started thinking, it's like, oh my goodness. What is Noah teaching me? What is Abraham teaching me? Well, this morning, I want to take a look at this individual I've never talked about, but it's a woman in the Bible named Rahab. Rahab was a harlot. (gasps) Oh my God. I said a harlot. She's a prostitute. She was the porn star of Jericho. I like that definition, right? It's like all of us. That's exactly the reaction I was thinking. She was an individual who was immoral in her her, her, um, livelihood. But yet, God did something. And now she has advice for you and I. She has something that she wants to speak to us today. Even though she's dead, she's walking through these doors this morning. 
and she's got her little red shawl on. And she's going to say something to you today. <laughs> it's going to be worth listening. Amen. Amen. If I don't, st- it's 12 o'clock. Are you serious? <laughs> what in the world? Preach it, brother. Come on. Come on All right. Sorry. It's, it's late. So let's talk about this chick. One passage of scripture says it this way. Can you put that up? By faith, the harlot, Rahab, did not perish with those who didn't believe. Why not? She was a freaking prostitute. Mira, she walked into church today. (laughs) I can't believe she stepped in there. I'm not going to sit by her. I'm not going to listen to anything she said. Listen, the scripture is clear. Rahab, even though she was defiled, she was defiling herself, God restored her life so that she's not connected to those who were living that way all their life. And one moment in her life, she believed, she grabbed a hold of God, she turned to God, and by faith now she's in the heroes of faith, and she has advice that she wants to speak to us today with. And so it says that she did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. So let me give you the scenario scenario and and background. I need you to get your homework done this week. Your homework is just to read Joshua, the second chapter, because that's where you'll find the story. And I'm not going to go through it like I did in the first service. I'm just going to give you a summary. Are you okay with that? Because it's already 12 o'clock. And if I could, I would stay here till three because the Cowboys start. But I'm going to give you guys an opportunity to... Get some barbecue or something. Rahab, the backstory of Rahab has to do with Joshua, with Jericho, and with um, Rahab herself. So Moses, remember they led them out of Egypt. And he was trying to lead them into something called the promised land. You remember that? Well, they didn't ever get to the promised land. Moses died. The next person he mentored was this guy named Joshua. And Joshua uh, was about to enter into the promised land, but there was something in between uh, where they were at and the promised land. Uh, What was in the way was something called Jericho. Jericho was this massive city. It was the first city that they had to contend with. Fortified walls. There was an outer wall. There was an inner wall. Uh, The outer wall was where the people that were not living a good lifestyle, that's where they lived at. That's where Rahab lived at. As a matter of fact, she was on the edge of the wall, way at the highest place. I wonder how she got all those high places at the best, you know, view and everything. Well, she was a harlot. Hello. She didn't inherit it from her dad. She got it with, you know, just not living well. There's also an inner wall. And that's where, like, the, all the food sources and all the palaces, the temple, the, the good stuff was happening. And a lot of the, the better people or the moral people or individuals who were covenant with God, that's where they lived. And so that was in the way. It was in between the promise and, and where they were at, and just like it is right now. In between, on your journey right now, before you get to the promise that God's given you and the dream to fulfill that dream that God's given you about your marriage or business or whatever that is, there's always a Jericho in your way. And it's got big fortified walls, outer walls, inner walls, inner walls, outer walls, fleshly gratifications. Oh man, he looks good. He's got a six pack. Man, that gal looks fine. I think I'm going to ask her to go to lunch. I see her. She keeps looking at me. Outer walls, inner walls. And so it stood in the way. And so Joshua said, man, I've got to get to the promised land. So he said, I'm going to send a couple of spies over there. So he sends two spies over there. And he's going to go check out what the climate's like and see how they're going to enter in and destroy Jericho. And so he sends these two spies in there. And the two spies, when they go into the outer wall area, they go to none other than Rahab the porn star of Jericho. It's like, hey, I want to talk to you. I want to ask you some questions. Yeah, sure, whatever. And so they go in there and they they began to ask 
different questions. Well, Rahab already knew. You know, I think it was a divine appointment. Why did they go straight to her? God knew the situation in her heart. God knows everything about you. Even in your lowest despicable place, he knows exactly the heart cry that's inside. How many guys can look back and say, man, when I was at my lowest, I remember when I was shooting dope inside of a, ba- of a bathroom at Shamrock with a needle. I remember so vividly crying out to God. And I felt at that time that he wasn't hearing me. He knew exactly what was going on in her heart. And so the spies go in, they begin to speak. And Rahab knew that they had heard about the God who was going to come in. They had heard about this God who, you know, all the plagues, they'd heard all these stories. And she was at a crossroads. She had to figure out, okay, what am I going to do? My life is in jeopardy right here. I'm either going to identify with the society that I'm living in, or I am going to identify and get away from that place and yield to the Savior that's about to destroy this city and I will still be alive. What am I going to do? Abraham, bottom line, big story short, is that she chose to serve the God, to honor him, to recognize him as God, the God of the living, the God that is able, is above all. And she made a little um, uh, 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 an agreement with them. Because all of a sudden, the king in, that, in, in Jericho, they found out that the spies were in there. And they were looking for the spies, and they had heard they went to Rahab's house. Hey, where are the spies at? Well, Rahab had already put it in her heart that I'm going to protect these guys. But I'm also going to make an agreement with them that if I protect you, you protect me. And big, big story, that's exactly what happened. He goes, listen, I'm going to hide you. And, 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 and here's what I'm going to ask. If I hide you... When you come and destroy this place, I want you to protect me and let me and my family live. And the, 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 the spy said, okay, if you protect me, I'll protect you. But if you go around behind my back and start talking about all this stuff, we're not protecting you. You're going to die. And here's what I want you to do. And they take a robe, a red rope, and they give it to her. And whenever you see the word, uh, whenever you see the color red in scripture, whether it's a scarlet thread or a rope or whatever, you'll know that that's a covering and that it's symbolic of the blood of Jesus because it was his blood that was shed so that we can be forgiven of all of our sins. And she says, I want you to hang this rope because she let them down from that high place where she was living that she let them down on the rope so that they could escape. He goes, but I want you to leave this rope on the outside of your home here so that when we come and destroy this place, if we see the red rope still hanging there, you and your household, anyone who's in your home will live. And it's kind of like the Old Testament with Moses. When the death angel came in, they said, if I see the blood you know, sprinkled on the doorpost of your home, you're gonna, you're gonna survive, your, your kids will survive. It's the same idea. So she did that, they did that. Jericho takes place, the war takes place, they march around, Every day, on the seventh day, they march around seven times that day. And then when they blew the trumpet, all the walls of Jericho just fell flat. But what they saw was the window with the red rope hanging down from it. And that was Rahab's house. And Joshua said, when you go in, you make sure that they're protected and that they come out safe, that they come out alive. But you don't understand, Josh. She's a freaking prostitute. I don't care. You go protect them. You watch over them. They made a covenant with us. And by the Lord's mercy, she will be protected. And so she was protected. And she was alive afterwards. And she became a part of the lineage of Jesus. Everywhere in the Bible, when you look at Rahab's name, it says, Rahab the harlot, Rahab the harlot, except in Matthew's gospel, first chapter. In Matthew's gospel, it says, Rahab the mother of Boaz. And Boaz had a son named Obed. Obed has another son named Jesse. Jesse has another son named David, who's the king of Israel, 
who becomes a part of the lineage of Jesus the Messiah. So he totally saved her and she became a part of an important piece that you and I play in, which is a covenant with our Heavenly Father. When you look at the lineage of Jesus, you'll see a prostitute there. You're not identified by your past, my friend. You're identified by your covenant with Jesus. And so if Rahab was to come in today and she was to say, I got a message for you. What would she say? Well, one of the things she would say is that you and I aren't identified by our past failures. Some of you live with that inner critic like I did, constantly throwing you away. You're just an alcoholic, man. You're just an old, broken down person. You'll never get to that place again. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Because why? Because Rahab is coming in and she's your mentor today. And she's saying, don't you believe that? You're never identified by your past. As a matter of fact, here's what she says. She goes, here's what she says. She say, Johnny, Loretta, Julia, Shamakia, whatever it is, Juan, here's what she's saying. Here she, she says, God will save those with the past. Not only will God save those with the past, God will also use those with the past. Not only will God save those and use those with the past, God will also redefine your past. So you no longer will look at yourself as a harlot, as a whore, as a prostitute, as a drug addict, as someone that doesn't mean anything to anyone. Now you will, you will see yourself how God sees you through his blood as a child of the living God. One who's been forgiven and redeemed from all destruction. One who has a purpose. That's how he sees you. And that's Rahab's um, advice to us today. That's what she's saying. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.